Okay, so I'm going to start today with a little airing a little bit of dirty laundry. Okay, this is from um, the technical appendices of my most cited paper. Okay, it's a random little function from from in there. And if you look at it, what you might notice is that it's full of errors. Okay, <laughs> like like check this out. They're, they're, they're the same here. That's that's probably these one of these should have been a ROP, whatever a ROP, I don't know what a ROP is, but. And then, like, like what happened here? Like, the order of the arguments are somehow randomly permuted in this. <laughs> it's like, well, okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, good news for me. It's not just me. This is a paper where we did an empirical study of ICFP papers and uh, found that every single paper that we looked at had an error in it, okay? Inclu <laughs> including two of them that, had, that were backed by, uh, you know, mechanized meta theory. Um, and, I, okay, so I don't mean to say that the research community is somehow hollow, you know, ICFP or whatever, um, that there's, that there, you know, it's like medicine or something like that. Um, <laughs> 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 is this being recorded? Okay. <laughs> uh, um, but what's going on is that none of the errors that we found um, were invalidating the central results of any of the papers. Instead, what's happening is that the errors make it much harder to understand and sort of slow down our ability to build on each other's work, uh, almost to the point where it becomes easier to reinvent things than to use what somebody else has come before. So this is, very, this is a very bad state of affairs. Okay, so this is the same program that I, uh, the same function that I showed you on the first slide, but now written in a different programming language. How many people know this, recognize this programming language? Okay, because like I'm totally envious of you if you don't know JavaScript, and that's not part of your life, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's the exact same function, all the same exact errors in it, okay. <coughs> and when you look at that first slide, what I think you probably imagined is, did this guy's co-author proofread the paper, <laughs> right? But when you look at this, what do you think? Where did this guy go to undergrad school? Didn't they teach him about testing, <laughs> right? It's a totally different reaction, and yet it's the same function. Okay, so that's the place where Red X, the subject of this talk, starts. And the idea is that the things we produce can, in fact, be implemented as programs. And then we can just apply all this wonderful software engineering knowledge we have, we have about how to make code mostly work and get our papers to el eliminate errors from our papers. All right. So um, this is Red X. And it's, it, this is the foundation of Red X. Okay, this little stick figure that's running. Things run when you put them into Red X. All right, so these are, these are kind of three points I've picked out about Redux to, to, to mention to you now. Um, Redux's design is influenced by this idea of the semantics life cycle, and it's an analogy to the software life cycle. You have some idea about some formal model in PL that you want to work on, so you start thinking about what exact, what model do I want, how does it work, and then you get to the point where you're like, okay, I'm pretty sure this is the model that I want, and you want to make it make the model, um, you know, try to eliminate errors from the model, then you want to publish the model. So Redux has a whole bunch of tools that support you through this process. Um, Redux's notation, so Redux is in Racket. It's an embedded domain-specific language, um, and Racket is uh, a derivative of a scheme, so in the Lisp family, so lots of parentheses. So with the parens aside, though, it really tries to stick to the notations and papers. And you, you we'll see that in a minute, but, you know, so with parentheses around every sub-expression, but otherwise really following the notations that you see commonly in papers. That's a big influence on the design of Redux. And then most of the bulk of the talk, I'm going to talk about how Redux can um, make up stuff. Okay, and I'll, I'll bring that in and explain what I mean by that and uh, talk about why that's important. Okay, so let me give you a little demo of Redux. Okay, so here is, um, this is a Redux program. It's in the Racket language. And then that second line there says, pull in the embedded domain-specific language Redux. And this is our first construct in Redux, define language. So this, here we are. So this, um, this expression here, this, this blue, is uh, defining a grammar. So we're, we've got non-terminals E and tau and X and V and capital E and gamma. And it's defining a little language of expressions. So we have lambda expressions, application expressions, variables, conditionals, true and false. In our language, uh, we've got types, this, this thing, variable not otherwise mentioned, this means that X can be anything except, anything that's blue, except it won't be any of the literals in the, that appear in this grammar. So it won't be arrow, it won't be lambda, 
uh, it won't be true false if it won't be this little dot. Anything, any, any literal in this line is not allowed to be, but anything else that would appear blue in this file could be can be an X. Okay, that's what that means. And there's oh. blue is is a color. Is that is it? Uh, what's the It's not very important. Okay. It's a symbol. Okay, that's yeah. <laughs> right, go, or you can come to the front. Why don't you come? There's a I, I don't. Yeah, okay. <coughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. So you could specify um, uh, the binding structure of the of the grammar. So here we're here. It's saying that um, the only thing that binds a variable is the lambda form. And the x is bound in e. That's what this refers to. This is like a postfix operator on. So anytime you see something that has this shape, lambda x tau e, then this x is bound in e. Okay. We can define a type system. So here's the type system. Um, so you see, you see, uh, it's, a, it's the low tech uh, <laughs> line of hyphens here, meant to evoke the the standard notation. Like I was saying, with a few more parentheses. So like, let's look at uh, let's look at the if rule. Um, so uh, the, the if rules, it's, it's the standard way that you write the typing rule for if. It says that if in the environment gamma E1 is a bool and E2 is a tau and E3 is a tau, then the expression you get by combining that E1, E2, E3 into an if expression is also a tau. Okay? So that's, that's the rule for if. And, th and the other ones are all basically following the same, um, the same pattern, you know, what, you've, what you're used to, I hope. And uh, then we have, oh, this lookup function. So lookup is used in the variable rule. Um, so this, this where is a way that it binds tau, saying, you know, call the lookup function. Um, and we'll, we'll, come we'll come back to this lookup function. The, so one, one, uh, one thing I'll point out now, but which we'll come back later, is that, is that lookup returns tau or something that's not a tau, right? And that's, so it doesn't, like, raise an error or something like that. It just returns a non-type, okay? And so this, this binding form where we say where tau, this means that lookup had to actually return a, a tau and not the bottom thing. Otherwise, the rule doesn't apply. All right. Um, here's the way that we define. Uh, so let me, let, me, let me run this program. So we can say show derivations, build derivations. So, so we can like let's make a term here uh, x bool x true. So I've got a I've got an if expression where the test position of the if is a call to the identity function on true, and then like I don't know false and true maybe for the for those and then uh, oh right and the type okay and so uh, sorry. That that's an old bug in Dr. Racket. We should really talk to the Dr. Racket maintainers about that. Don't know who they are. <laughs> Certainly nothing related to anything about Redix, I'm sure. Okay. Okay. So it'll it'll build a, a derivation of uh, the ex this the the type. You know the, this. So this is a proof that that term has a particular type, and the type that it has. I just put tau, but it figured out that the type was bool, and that's because of the way that the judgment form was written down. Um, and I. I didn't show you, but some annotations in the judgment form let you put in variables in this position and not other positions, and it will then compute what the answer is going to be there. And you can see how it does it. So, like, there's the if rule. Remember, we had three premises for the if rule. So here are the three kind of subtrees for the three sub-expressions in the if rule, and it just builds this tree. Okay. All right. Um, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions or, you know, if anything is not clear or if you're colorblind and are annoyed. And Yeah. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so this is kind of a punny sort of a thing. This, the turnstile is the name of the relation. Right, that's right. So when I say, when I say define judgment form here, um, I specify that, you know, it's, it's basically, it's, yeah, it's the name of this judgment form that I'm defining. Correct. Correct. Exactly, exactly. And so whatever whatever 
symbol you put here is, is what is the name that it's there. So it's kind of a, it's a pun, yeah. Yeah. You type in the LaTeX and then you hit the magic LaTeX to Unicode button. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, right. Okay, so here's, here's, the, here's how we run programs. This is a reduction relation. There's three rules that you, that you can use to evaluate programs. So this is, the, this is the beta value rule. It's saying that in an evaluation context, capital E, if I see an expression of this shape, so like an application expression where I have a lambda and I've got the argument ready, then I can replace that with substitution by calling substitution. And substitute is something built into RedX. Um, what it does is it looks at that binding form specification and then based on that defines a capture avoiding substitution function. Um, the, e the if rule is a little simpler. It says that if I have an if expression, where the test position is true, then I can just replace that whole if expression with the expression that would be in the then branch of the if. Okay? And the same thing for false. So we could, we could take this expression, so you, you call it traces, so this is part of the embedded nature of the domain, you know, the embedded domain specific language. Um, and then it'll show us, like, so you can see, you can see how it reduces. So in the first step, we used application. So then we got a value in the test position, and then we could um, apply the if true rule there. So this is this is how Redix thinks about evaluation. It thinks about evaluation the way you were taught, like eighth uh, in the United States anyway. One would be taught in the eighth grade, you know, plug and chug, simplify expressions. That's the model that uh, Redix is using for understanding what it means to evaluate a program. Okay, and then the last thing in the file is this type sound, and I won't read this to you, but I'll tell you what it's doing. This is a racket function now. And so here we are exploiting the embedded domain-specific language aspects of RedX. And it just calls into a bunch of stuff. It's using red here, which is the same thing I used to generate that window we just saw. And what it does is it you give it an arbitrary, you give it whatever E you want, it checks whether that's typed, that has a type. If it has a type, then it applies that thing. It basically does the non-GUI version of this. And then until it, until it doesn't reduce anymore, and then checks to see if that's a value, according to the grammar definition of values, and then checks to see if that value has the same type. Okay. And so we can, we can say redx check l e. Um, and what this does is it tries to break your program, tries to break your semantics. So it just makes up um, a thousand E's from the grammar L, which was the grammar we that was defined at the top of the file, and then just calls this type sound function over and over and over again. And this time, in these 1,000 attempts, type sound returned true every time. So it says, okay, I guess I didn't find a counterexample, and then tells you about it. Okay? Yeah, exactly. So what, what actually this is doing is the subject of most of the talk. So we're going to dig deep into that uh, in a moment. But let's, let's, um, let's add something to this model so you get a feel for what it's like to do some redexing. All right, nobody starts with the, you know, lambda calculus has been around for a little while, so nobody starts like afresh, right? We start with, a, with a, these hundred lines or whatever it is. So we can add an or expression here, and uh, we can add a typing rule for or. So I copied the if rule, so I don't have to, so something like this, and so it's a bool. So, um, the or of E1, E2 is going to be a bool if E1 is a bool and, uh, you guessed it, E2 is a bool. Let's call this the or rule. And I apparently am. Okay. Okay, does this seem right to people? Yeah? Okay. So um, let's run it. And now uh, we won't. It's not type sound now, okay? Because um, we we found a new kind of type, well typed expressions, but they don't reduce, right? And in order to be type sound, you have to either it has to either produce a value or it has to not type check. And here the exi or true true doesn't reduce at all because we didn't add that rule yet, right? So Redix finds that counterexample for us to the type soundness. Okay, let's add a rule for the or. What do you think? How sh what should uh, Anyone, anyone want to take a stab at how OR expression should reduce? Yeah. 
true E goes to E true okay yes good <laughs> although putting E would not break types on this so <laughs> okay that that looks good to me right so we we're gonna evaluate um, if we have a true in the first one then we don't care what the second one is so we can just dis we're done with the or so we can replace the whole expression with the true all right so I'm thinking we probably want to look at what is or false do what is that what do you think what should wh what if we got a false in the in the test position of the or in the first position of the or it goes to e yeah good okay all right let's 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 tr let's see let's see how well we did okay what do you think oh great done <laughs> right let's let me try a few more attempts i'm seeing i'm seeing a certain uh so I'm seeing some grimaces here in the second <laughs> row. Let's see what happens if we do this. Oh, wait, attempts. You know, you know that this is actually not, oh, hello. We didn't add it to the evaluation context, right? So if you have a nested, so capital E doesn't have anything about or in it. So if you have nested ors, it won't go inside the nested or and try it. So you're, we're sh we should have, this or true true inside should have reduced, but this says, um, in whole e, so this so in whole is a way of like breaking an, a tree into two pieces, something outside and something inside. And so what this says is break it and so call this part the outside part and call this the inside part. So this will be like a tree with a with a certain hole in the middle somewhere, especially in the middle of it, where where at that hole is this thing. And so we have to say that capital E is allowed to go inside or expressions. So let's go back up here. Where's capital E? And the, the thing we want here is this. Okay, so this says that, um, this is saying that we can decompose an expression by looking inside the first position of the or, because that, that's what matches to our rules, right? You, um, our rules consider a values in the first position, so we have to like be able to get to, it, get to the first position. All right, let's see what happens if we run this. It's gotta work, right? Okay, so, so far as I know, there are no, this <laughs> is right. This is this is type sound for any one of those ten thousand expressions. So nobody, I mean, who's going to write more programs than that? Okay. And so this is one way to do it. But actually, there's another way that I'll show you really quickly, and then we'll get we'll be done with the demo after that. So um, anybody heard of parallel or? Yeah, there's these domain theory people, and they had a lot of problem with like junks in their models, and like this was a, it's a kind of a cool construct though. That okay, that has some sad history associated with it in a way. Um, and and uh, so a parallel or means that you're going to evaluate either branch, and as soon as one of them gives you a false, then the whole thing is, uh, let's see, as soon as one of them gives you a true, the whole thing can be true. And when both of them give you a false, then it's a false. So like if one's going to diverge, you don't know which one's going to diverge, but if, if either one of them diverges but the other one returns true, then you want to you return true. So we can model that in Redux. And um, step one is to allow evaluation of both sides of the or like this. And then we have to change the actual rules for or a little bit. So we want to say this rule and we want this rule. So we have a, um, if we have a true on the left, then it's going to be true. If we have a true on the right, then we can discard the E. So like if the other one is diverging, that's okay. And then really, then, then we don't want this rule anymore. I mean, this rule I think is, yeah, yeah. We, this is the rule that we want. So this is the other case that's missing, right? So, if you, so it's a different way to define or, okay? It gives you this parallel or. And uh, let's see if I dig this term back out again. Or right, well let's put an or into it. Let's do or of these two things. So then Redux will show you, you know, the reduction graph that you get, um, which has got some sharing and stuff going on in here. So, so you can see, like, this, this is the original term in the upper left, and... Um, the one to the right of it up there, it reduced on the right-hand side, so it, it, it did the function call in that, in that second if, and the one down here did the function call in the first if, and then they come back together here, and, you know, the, so, you, so you, get, you get all the, it right shows you all, it doesn't care what the relation is necessarily that you're defining, it doesn't, it's not saying to you, well, here's like an actual implementation of parallel or, it's just showing you, this is the reduction graph that you get, this is all reducible expressions, right? So that's Red X. Yeah. So, 
So it turns out there's no divergence in this language. Is that where you're going? No. I mean, you can, but it won't type check. Um, so we could we could add. I mean, okay, maybe we should. Maybe we should. We. Oh, we don't. I tested ten thousand things. Some of them were probably interesting. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I'm not. I'm not completely sure. I understand. Are you asking something about this particular? I'm. I would not stand behind this and say I want to publish this as a paper. If that's what you're. If that's where we're going. <laughs> yeah. You could. You can. Yeah. So I mean, my particular tastes would be to. To do something like, we could stick a we could stick an f right here, or a, v an, a variable here. Maybe stick an f. Yeah, we could add just bottom uh, and, and add a rule for bottom reduces to itself. We could we could make recursive functions by adding a variable there, and then now we have to change the rule, make two calls to substitution instead of one. So it's very flexible. You can you can model whatever you want to model with it. So you could do all these things. Um, if you actually had expressions that diverged, you might have to be a little bit careful because the way I've written the type soundness property doesn't hold. Um, it, it, in fact, would diverge for if it was given a divergent term, which is okay because there aren't any here. So you'd have to write a different um, property that, that you want to check. But yeah, we're This is in fact bad style, I would say. Um, and the right way to do it is you should define like your language, and then you should define you should have a second grammar that defines the things that are relevant for the evaluation, and separate out the things that are relevant for type checking. And you should have you yeah, it's better style if you do that. And you can Red X supports like language extension to do that. Yeah. Like in your paper, you shouldn't have you know this and that figure one, right? <laughs> it should be in the figure that has the evaluator. In it. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Okay, all right. So, um, what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about today is pr uh, property-based testing. So, what was going on in re inside Redix Check? Um, so, property-based testing, you need two things. You need uh, a property, and then you need some way to generate expressions. So, and the property always has to have a particular shape. It has to be some universally quantified um, sentence o with you know with that's the only quantifier you get. And uh, you have to have some computable, some effective procedure for figuring out getting a Boolean, true or false, out of this property. So for the rest of this talk, we can, there's a lot of ways you can think about doing this. One very useful one, I, I think, just in the real world, is like doesn't crash. Okay? Um, but there's a lot, generally, software has a lot of properties that you can write. And for today, we can just think about RedX as a domain-specific language for writing down properties um, uh, for particular artifacts that I happen to care about, and maybe some of you do too. And, and we'll spend some time trying to generate x's, y's, and z's and see how well we can do with it. Okay, so I want to explain to you three generators um, written by Casey, Max, and Burke. Okay, so we'll start with Casey's. Casey implemented a lot of stuff in Red X, actually. Um, so Casey's generator is uh, a fairly straightforward generator. It says, you would like an E, please? Okay, I'll start out with, I don't know what E I'm going to give you yet. And then I'll go get the grammar for E. And I will randomly choose one of the productions, if. OK, so I know I'm going to make an if expression. And if inside has three e's, so then uh, I need to do this three times. So I'll pick three more e's. And what did I get? True, false, and true for those three e's. So I'll plug those in the question marks. And then it terminates, OK, because we've got a complete expression. And now we can feed this off to the property and see if we found it, if it's a counterexample or not. <coughs> OK, so one thing you might ask about this is, did we get lucky that it terminated there? Right, once we made the choice to generate an if expression, what were the odds that we actually terminated in the next step? 
So if you look at the grammar, you'll see there's three possibilities in each case that it terminates and three possibilities that it doesn't terminate. So it's a 50-50 chance that it terminated for each of these. So it's a 12 and a half. So yeah, we got lucky, right? So um, in, in general, uh, with, with, with this grammar, you have about a 36% chance that the tree you, you end up generating doesn't fit in any reasonable amount of memory. And in fact, this is pretty robust to any memory. You know, 100K or 10 gigabytes, basically it's the same 38% chance that you didn't turn. So you need some way to force termination. Okay? And so um, what Casey does is he tracks how big the term has gotten. And then once the term gets past a certain size, he doesn't make a random choice from all the productions. He makes a random choice only from the ones he knows are going to lead to some terminal in the grammar. So if you look at E here, um, after he gets past a certain depth, I think it's five is the default for what we were seeing in the demo, then um, he doesn't choose from the first, the second, or, th or this if expression one. And so um, the way he knows which ones to choose from, it's basically a graph search problem. Right, you just find you find routes to terminals that don't involve cycles. So it's pretty straightforward in this grammar, but in general, you have to. It's just a, It's not a too difficult graph search problem. Um, graph some graph problem cycles in a graph. Okay. All right. So how well does this generator work? So this is Burke. We have a brief interlude from Burke. We'll get back to Burke more later. When he he made a benchmark as well as making a, his own generator. Um, and his benchmark has 50 bugs in it, and they come from these models. Most of these models are uh, models that we built and that we introduced errors into them based on our own experience. I've written a lot of buggy Redux programs as sort of have a feel for um, what tends to go wrong in them. And so a lot of these bugs are coming from that um, experience, really. Um, this, this delim cont is from a uh, gradual typing paper where they were studying delimited control. And we mined the git history of it. They built a Redux model as they went. And we got three bugs from their Git history. Um, the the RVM uh, model is is different than the others in the sense that these are all basically paper-sized models, and RVM is the model of the Racket Virtual Machine, so it's a lot bigger model than the other models. Yeah, okay, so that's the benchmark suite. Um, here is we'll see a few of these plots, so let me take a moment to explain this plot. This is the results for Casey's generator. <coughs> so the number of bugs is going vertically, and then time is going horizontally. And each one of these little upticks is when it found one more bug. And the way we say when it found one more bug is I just I got a machine where there was nothing else going on in the machine, and I just over and over and over generated terms and fed them in, and I counted the interval between occurrences of you know finding a counterexample to the property. And I either stopped after eight hours or after that average converged to something, sort of the, av the average average uh, number of seconds stopped moving. Okay, so. It, it found the, the, the bug that it found the quickest was this one right here. Um, so, y so you get a sense of what's going on in this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah each of the 50 bugs in this, in this each of these 50 bugs. Ah. So that's, well, hopefully we did a good job making the benchmark suite, and there is only one bug in each of these, so each of these models, so whatever, eight, the eight models here, there's each, each have a little diff of about two lines or some number, small number of lines that introduces a bug and they have a property that comes with it that's falsified by that. So there's, there are seven that follow. Yeah, there's seven, that's right. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. Each of these comes with a, with like, yes, yes. Each of these comes with a little diff which is then applied to the model to introduce one bug and then there's a property that's falsified, and hopefully there's no other bugs. I believe there's no other bugs, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Yeah. No, no, no. There are many counterexamples for each bug, but there should hopefully be sort of only one logic, what you would call a bug when you look at the program. Yeah. That's correct. This is, yes, that's correct. So I, I did the 50 different runs. E from each of those runs produced an average. Each of those averages corresponds to one uptick in this graph. So it's like a summary of how well we're doing. Uh, uh, part of, uh, you know, this is not all the information that we have from the, from this, from the runs. It's just kind of like an overview of how well it's doing. So that, you know, if, it, if it goes up faster, that's better. Right? That's one way to think about it. 
Um, one of the things that's kind of deceiving about these plots is the log scale of them. So like check out this, this kind of looks like a, looks like there's a lot of stuff happening here around 100 seconds. But this is, this is like five seconds where it starts going up, and this is about five minutes where it stops where this plateau is. So things are kind of stretched out in the log scale. Okay, so be watch out for that sort of thing. All right, so this is our baseline. This is, this is not a complicated algorithm to implement. Okay? Um, and, uh, you know, it's sort of surprising how well it works, I would say. Because it's, you know, it's not super smart. Okay, so that's our that's our baseline. Um, hello, Max. Max um, developed something called bijective enumerations, and so let me explain to you what those are, and then we'll see how we can use them to generate um, examples to try and falsify the properties. Okay, so a bijective enumeration is we're enumerating some T's, and an enumeration consists of four pieces. We have a contract. And that basically, that's what recognizes T. So you can think of this thing as like a predicate function on, on T's. Um, Max's library works with like streams and functions and it's more complicated than that in general. But for, the, for today, you can really just think of this as like a predicate function. Is that, a, is, that a, is that the T I want? Is that an expression from this particular grammar or something like that? Um, you get a size. So that tells you how big the T's are. You need that to be able to build up uh, bigger enumerations out of one. And then you get this bijection here um, between the t's and the natural numbers. So think of this as a way to like pick out a particular one, a particular t. You know, I want number 10. I want number 50 billion, whatever. Okay. So here's um, our first bijective enumeration, sort of a, the dumbest one possible. We can make a bijection between the natural numbers and the natural numbers with the identity function. So this is like the dumbest one there is, and it kind of gets us started. And that's sort of the flavor of this library, is there's a bunch of little <coughs> dumb ones, and there's a bunch of combinators that you can use to build more interesting ones out of the dumb ones. Okay, so our kind of the main workhorse bijection is the pairing bijection. Um, you give it a T with an F and an F inverse and some size N, and you give it one that enumerates T primes with G and G inverse and size M, and then the pairing combinator will build one that enumerates the pairs of them, and of course, the size of that will be the product. Okay, I'll show you, uh, this, this functions don't fit here, um, but I'll give you the idea of the functions in the next slide. And you can see, this is the, this is the um, enumeration of all pairs of natural numbers going by here. So you can see like 0, 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4, 0, 4, 1. You can, you can see that there's no repeated, nothing is repeated in this bijection. Right, it's a bijection. <laughs> okay. Um, here's the function. Um, so if you think about going along the top as like the t's and going vertically as like the t primes, and I've written out the indices of, of them, I didn't, you know, because it works for any of them. So then what you have to do is you have to find your way to like get to every single square and not duplicate any squares on this infinite plane going kind of this way. So um, if you look at this for a minute, you can kind of see that the, there's a pattern is it goes, it goes across and then it goes down and then it goes across and then it goes down, and it goes across and down. So it's building like wider and wider squares as it moves away from zero, zero. Um, have you heard of the Cantor pairing function? Yeah, okay, so that, that's, that builds, that's doing diagonals, right? Okay, so that, um, we use this one because this one generalizes better to like n-ary n-tuples. Um, so for like, for this one, for three dimensions, you can think of it like wider cubes. And this one's also easier to compute the inverse because here you're, do you're doing like nth roots to compute the inverse, whereas um, the, n the generalized Cantor one, it's, I don't think we know how to compute the inverse. It's basically a search procedure is the best known way to compute it, which is too slow for us. Okay, so, so anyway, this is, this is the shape of the function. Um, one more combinator we'll look at is alternation. So this builds a union. Um, this builds a real union, and you have to have, in order to use this one, t and t prime have to be disjoint. So that you're going to get the sum. So you're really going to get every element. So if there's any duplicate elements between t and t prime, then, um, then it won't be a bijection. So you can use another combinator to make sure that there's no, there's no overlap by sticking something in there, doing the usual disjoint union thing. Here's the function. So it just alternates, right? And so here's the alternation between um, the naturals and the pairs of naturals. You get a, you don't get a bijection. 
you're, you've made a mistake. The library is, uh, I won't say it has undefined behavior, but it has undefined behavior, <laughs> right? So we have a contract, and the contract kind of, of course, randomly samples and to see if you find any overlap. Um, but yep, yep. But the but the yeah, but the finite ones are giant, so you really can't check it if that's where you're going. Oh yeah, th sorry. This I've just showed you the function for the infinite case. Yeah. yeah. In the finite case, you have to do something interesting when one runs out before the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. So there's a bunch of common. There's a bunch of other combinators. These are some of the more important ones. Um, delay is a way that you tie a recursive knot. So we have we have pairing and we have alternation and we have like a base case and so we put that together with recursive knots and we can enumerate <laughs> binary trees now. Um, I'll point out one more. This is the dependent pairing combinator. So um, it's like a pair, except you give it an enumeration, and then the other side of the pair, you don't give it straight up an enumeration. You give it a function that maps from the whatever's in the left to a new enumeration. So you can vary what's in the right based on what appears in the, you can vary the entire enumeration on the right based on what appears in the left. And you can use that to do things like um, binary trees that have some form of balance in them. So like AVL trees require that they're left and right the height is within one of each other. And so this is an enumeration of those trees only. Okay, and you can do that with the dependent pairing operator. Okay, and these are bijections. So we can, you know, I've just shown you kind of the prefix of it by sort of counting through the first few natural numbers. <coughs> this is a tree I, I happen to like. <laughs> okay, and there's its index. Okay, and the reason I show this to you is because on my laptop, it took only, only about five milliseconds to compute that. And that's because these um, combinators, they, um, almost all of them, those functions that they build up, the f and the f inverse functions that they build up inside there, take time proportional to, are they're basically, almost all of them are linear in the um, representation of the number of the index, not, so they're, they're log in, in this number. So this is like giving an input of like a thousand, not giving an input of some ridiculously large number. So it's able to compute pretty quickly with them. Okay. Here's how well it does. We experimented, okay, so, so his enumerators basically reduce the problem of generating a term to generating an in a natural number. And there's a lot of ways you can think of making up natural numbers. The way we found that works the best is just count. You start with zero and then one and then two and then three and go like that. So that's what the red line represents. Okay, that's the generator that we're getting here. And, um, so you can see that it does better, and then it stops doing better than the random generator. And, okay, so I said it before, but I'll say it again. This is a log plot. So any separation is a lot of separation. So like the gap between here and here is something like 100x faster, something like that. Um, so I think what's going on here, although it's hard to really know because there's a lot of stuff flying around in, inside Red X at this point, is that the enumerator is better at making small terms that have a lot of variety in them. And then it kind of craps out after a while. So it, it starts making things that are like lambda expressions with different variables over and over, the same ones, but with different variables in them over and over again. And that they're sort of not, they're not really interestingly different. Um, but early on, it's making a lot of interestingly different ones. Whereas the random generator can make interestingly different ones at all different sizes. And so that's why it, that's why it, it continues to do you know, it continues to find bugs, basically, after this one has stopped finding bugs. And that's why this one finds bugs faster, because it's getting a lot of different, it kind of interestingly different terms right away uh, as it goes to the beginning. Yeah? For, for the random ones, how many of the terms are duplicates? Not many. Uh, I don't have numbers on that. But We d and we did experiment with that, and it, it does worse than, than both of these. It's like, it's like down here. <laughs> um, I have some numbers. I can show that to you later if you, if you want to see the, the actual graphs. But, and I'm not sure. Maybe I just, I'm not picking natural numbers the best way. That's also possible. Um, it's, not, it's not obvious how to sort of randomly sample from the natural numbers, I would say. Yeah. So, th so this worked. So... So we're happy, yeah. This, oh, by the way, this, um, so this also has the advantage that 
um, you get small counterexamples. So in fact, all the examples that we saw were actually coming from the red line um, when, during the demo. So th that's a, like a nice feature of this. If you give me a way to, uh, if you give me a uniform distribution of natural numbers, which I don't think you can, then we can get a uniform distribution. So, I've, so I, I, in other words, I'm not helping with the problem in some sense, but I've reduced the problem of, of uh, giving a uniform distribution of, of expressions to one of give me one of naturals. That's that's one way to look at what's happening here. They're bijections, so you're always getting, you know, every index is going to be a different, in that case, AVL tree or whatever else you build. I mean, you have to obey the constraints of the combinators. So the or is really a union, so you have to make sure you're the things you're oring are disjoint, you know. So there's like constraints like that, which are encoded as contracts in the library. Yep. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry, your or uh, is balanced between them. Yes. But if you're, if it's on the right hand, it's another or. Yes. If you for next all your ors to the right, rather than for balance the or. Yeah, those will look like different indices. Yep. The, the, yeah. So you're, yeah, there's, there's interesting questions about balancing in, in the pairing operation um, and how to, how to, there's, a, there's this, Okay, so I wasn't going to really talk about this, but this was Max's work was not actually the enumeration combinators that he implemented and we used in Redux. Um, the, the part that we've talked about here are not the sort of interesting technical part from like I want to make a paper, write a, get, produce some new knowledge about them. But this this thing question you're getting at is what he was studying and why he was studying them. So I have more to say about that, but maybe not right now. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question, and I'm going. That's where I'm going next. Um, but let me take a minute to get there. Um, so ju this is just for fun, this little section. Okay, for you know weirdos like me, it's sort of fun. Um, we have the smallest known counterexamples to all the bugs. You know, the smallest known, which means uh, not very much, I guess. Um, and these are their indices in the second column of each of these. Okay, because you can compute them because it's not expensive with the way Max implemented his uh, combinator library. And then the depth for some sense of scale here. So these numbers are giant. Okay, it's it's really hard to wrap your head around just how giant they are. So um, one thing I did was um, I looked at on the benchmark machine how often it was, you know, what's the count, what's the like attempts per second, and based on getting to these smallest known counterexamples, um, the ones that are in orange would take more than 100 years to get to at the rate the benchmark machine was going. Okay, and with the exception of see these three here with the poly STLC ones, if I take those out. These are the ones that it would have taken um, since the Big Bang until now, longer than that to get to. Okay, so these are <laughs> really big numbers. Okay, okay. Um, so getting back, yeah. No, 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 no. This is just based like I look at them, and I think that they're. I mean, I say smallest known, so that someone smallest known to me counterexamples. They're obviously not very small in this in this space of, um, you know, the the bijective space. Um, so, but I did little things like I know the bijec the the enumerators tend to pick variable names with a before they pick variable names with b. So I like made all my variable names be a's, and sometimes that can go way back in them. So I tried to make them small according to the numerator, but uh, probably there are smaller ones than these. No. Yes, <laughs> with this strategy, there's no way. In fact, here we, let's, this is the graph again. I'm only finding uh, what are we getting to like 20. 28 of them, only finding 28 of the 50 bugs with this strategy. And it's certainly not finding any of the ones that were orange. Because the smallest known counterexamples were given by, like I, the numerator told me them for the ones that are have small numbers on here. Kay. Okay, so one thing that's kind of disappointing about this graph is the space at the top. Like, let's get, I want to get a little higher than that, right? Okay. Um, and one way to 
understand what's going wrong with random generation or just generation of things in general, um, I, I was taught this, is you just kind of like look at them for a while. It's this, I don't know, it's like, I was like, you really, John Hughes told me this. And I was, he's like, we put, them on the, we put them on the projector and we go sit in the conference room and we just look at our generator. We just look, well, how's it doing? And so if you start looking, if you start doing this, start like, like oh, there's uh, free variables. <laughs> okay, that's not good. Um, there's a lot of falses and trues coming back. Here's true applied to G. That doesn't type check. Uh, a lot more falses. Oh, there's another free variable. Here's another free variable. There's true applied to false. There's a free variable. You know, there's like, okay, these, maybe these terms aren't so good, right? Because if it doesn't type check, then we're not doing anything. It just gets thrown away immediately in our property, right? Okay, so here's, um, here's a thousand terms, and I've colored them in, and I can you tell these two? I don't know. Yeah, okay, I, I tried to get colorblind colors for, the, for these ones, actually. Um, I, I colored them in based on uh, whether they type check or not. So the red ones, the ones over here, these ones, don't type check, and the blue ones do type check. And uh, you notice there's a bunch of trues and falses in there. Guess what these are? Okay, <laughs> so let's just color all but one true and one false red because they type check, but they're but you know the checking true over and over again is not so helpful. Let's say so we'll keep one of them blue and one of them uh, one true blue and one false blue. Oh, and these are sorted by the the printed length of them. So all the trues were coming before all the falses and then whatever else. Yeah. These are, sorry, these are random. These are from the Casey's generator. These are from the blue line. Okay, so uh, so this is, and we're going to get to that in just a sec. So 6% of, the, of that sample type checked. So that like a 20x speed up in the making, right? If we could do better than that, maybe. Um, this is the first thousand from the enumerator, and 13% of those type check. And these only have, there's only one true and one false in these. Um, if you, if you this is 5,000, the first 5,000, only 10% of those type check. And if you go out to the first 100,000, only 5% of those type check. So it's kind of the proportion is going down. Um, I don't think it goes too much below 5%, but it, it's, um, you know, you're, 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 you're not getting a lot of interesting type checking examples as you go further out in the enumeration either. Yeah. Correct. Ah, because those were from the random generator. Sorry. <coughs> so these these ones, this sample is from the the random generator, the Casey's generator, and uh, these the, these these two are from the enumerator. Yeah. I should have put that on the slide. That would have been. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of anti words on slides, so I should probably be a little bit less in this case. Okay. So enter Burke. Okay, I promised we'd get back to Burke. Burke wrote a generator that generates only well-typed terms. And the idea behind this generator is very similar to the Casey's generator in the sense that they both generate trees. Um, but what Casey does is he generates a tree that's the expression tree. And what Burke does is he generates a tree that's the derivation tree. So you remember that, that tree I showed you that was the wealth, the, re the argument why the if expression was well typed, it's tree. So that's, that's the kind of trees that, that, um, that Burke generates. Okay, so we'll, let's step through the algorithm so you get a sense of how this algorithm works. All right, this is the worst part of the talk, okay, I promise. After this, uh, you have some coffee right now. All right. So what you do is you take the rules from the type system, and that's the lookup function. So I put these on this. this Redux is typesetting these, by the way. All the stuff that you've seen on the slide is Redux is typesetting. It's from that same, it's from the, I made a copy of the file before, before editing it, and, and that's, what, that's how we get them on the slide here. So you ask, dear Burke, please give me um, an expression that type checks in the empty environment. So you, you give it some initial thing you want, and it's going to try to build the tree above this that matches that. So it will randomly choose one of the type rules, lambda, okay, and then it will stick it so that the conclusion of the randomly chosen rule has to match up to whatever the was at the top of your tree before. So our, our tree was just that at the beginning. So we put it here, and then we unify. So we declare that gamma 2 should be the empty environment, <coughs> E0 should be this lambda expression, and tau 1 should be this function type. So we unify these two together, and we collect those over in that empty box there for the equations. And now we have this tree. So we've made our tree a little bit bigger. 
So we have the lambda rule was on the bottom, and so now we have to satisfy the, the lambda rule has one premise, so we need another tree to go here. And we have, we're going to kind of keep doing this process and keep adding equations up here. So this time, uh, we pick the, the if rule. <coughs> so we're going we're gonna to equate gamma 7 and, and this environment. We're going to equate the uh, if expression and E5. So this if will be in the body of that lambda expression. And then these two are equated to each other. And now we have this tree, which of course has three premises now that we have to fill in. Okay, so this, uh, let's see, I picked the var rule. So let's put that there and unify that in, collect some more equations. The premise of the var rule was the lookup function, right? So now we have to choose randomly from one of the cases of the lookup function instead of choosing randomly from one of the cases of the type system itself. So uh, let's see what we get. All right. Um, I'm surprised by that. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, apparently. I didn't mean for I meant to fix the random seed, but maybe I maybe I did that wrong. Okay. But not surprising that it gave me well, okay. Anyway, yeah. Yes, it's definitely doing the random generation, um, but with a fixed seed, so I could sort of I, I picked I chose from a bunch of different ones to illustrate without because you they get trees can get big. <laughs> so I wanted to not kill you, but I'll also kind of get some interesting points. So, okay, so we pick the var rule again, um, and then, okay, so maybe I just misremembered what happened. So, all right, so we pick the var rule again, then we pick the case in the var, uh, in the lookup function, because that was the premise, and let's put that, let's bring that down. And it's going to do the unification again here, and this unification is going to fail, because bottom is not a type, right? In other words, we tried to look, it asked to look up a variable, so it randomly picked the case in the lookup function. It picked the case that looked it up in the empty environment. So you don't get a type back if you look something up in the empty environment. So this unification fails. So what Burke's algorithm does at that point is it says, okay, I'll just try again. And this time it randomly chose the second case in the lookup function, and this one succeeds. And so it, uh, the unification, so, okay. Does that make sense to people? So we're, we're randomly picking things, trying to drop them on top, and sometimes they don't, they're not consistent with the other things, so we just try again when that happens. Um, uh, here, here we pick the lambda rule, so let's bring that over. And this rule also fails. This time it doesn't fail straight up because, you know, gamma could be gamma, E could be a lambda, tau could be a function. Just if you just look here, it's okay. But if you, if you take this set of, those three equations and add them to this set of equations, the equations become unsatisfiable. Um, let's see if I can show you. Uh, tau 11 is tau 6, and tau 6 is, where is tau 6? Here, yeah, tau 6 is bool. So tau 11 already has to be bool. And here we would introduce the equation tau 11 equals the function type. And so the, these equations would become unsatisfiable. So, uh, so, so Burke says, no, pick again. So. That's right. That's right. Every step you have to, yeah. Yes. No. Random logic programming. The actual algorithm is more complicated um, uh, because uh, Redux allows you to write things are slightly more general. So, okay, so the actual solver has to have nothing that um, you haven't maybe seen before, but more than just prologue. So it has um, um, universally quantified variables, existentially quantified variables, negation, and er, not equals and equals. Those are the things you need. So you need to solve it for those. Yeah. Um, so Centaur, Mentar, you should check it out. It works great, I think. Centaur and Mentar, you should check out Centaur and Mentar. That, that, yeah. Um, we draw a lot of inspiration from those projects in Redux, no question. Okay, so this one, this one succeeds, and uh, you take the derivation, you take the equations, and um, 
you get this expression when you combine, put them all together. So, so in other words, if you solve for all the equations that are down here, um, if you look through these things, you'll see there's a whole bunch of x16, x13, whatever. Um, they all have to be equal to each other, but it doesn't say that they have to be a particular thing. So, um, so what Burke does is he calls Casey's generator in that case, and that's where we got the p from. But all the rest of this came from solving the equations. Okay, so here's here's Burke's generator on um, on the graph. It's this it's this new line that's on the top. So it's doing better, but not a lot better. Or not a lot, a lot better. It's it's better. I mean, this is remember this is a log scale, so it's it's better. But it's, it's uh, okay. So there's there's something kind of going on here. So here I've I've shown you um, another view onto the results. Um, this is uh, a Venn diagram showing you um, each of each of these little black things here is one of the bugs, and the shape tells you which model it's coming from. So you can see that um, there's a bunch of bugs that all the models can get. You can see that Burke's generator is finding a bunch that nobody else finds. And if you kind of look at this a little bit more, and what you might notice is there are no diamonds inside Burke's circle. No diamonds at all. That, so in other words, there's one model where it just is completely failing. Right. Even though there's six diamonds inside these two much, you know, sort of less high powered, I, I, they found six of those bugs, but Burke's can't find any of them. Okay, so if you dig into this, uh, into this a little bit, I would say that I don't completely understand why it's not finding what's going on there, but I understand a little bit. Um, and it basically, I think what's happening is that it's like, like Casey's generator, Burke's generator has this problem of growth. So if you happen to choose the if rule, now you've got three more to satisfy, and so you have this problem of um, generating things that are too big. Um, and... Um, and so you have this termination problem, so you have to decide somehow how to stop. But the way uh, Casey stops, the way the, the naive random generator stops, is it just finds paths to terminals. Terminals That doesn't work when you're trying to generate well-typed terms. For example, if you have to generate something that's an arrow type, the simplest way to do that is a lambda, right? And, and that requires you to make another expression. So um, this, this term, so the way he does it is he sorts the, uh, the rules by the number of premises that they have, and then biases the selection towards the ones with fewer premises. And that um, seems to not work for that model. Okay, that model's a little bit weird. It has the type judgment. All, all the all of the rules have one premise. <laughs> it's a, it, the type judgment's written in kind of a weird way. Um, so I think that's what's going on. Um, sorry. So this is this is the uh, this is what it tells you when you run. So this um, we, we ran these Redex check expressions during the during the demo. If you put this extra line satisfying and then you put um, uh, the type judgment there. So in this case, I'm asking for an application expression of an arbitrary type um, in the diamond model. Then uh, it, it actually makes a thousand, it fails every time. So I asked for a hundred of them, it failed every time. It didn't actually did run, do any testing. So that, ha that always happens. It never generates any application expressions. So it, it'll occasionally generate true and false and lambda x true, very rarely lambda x true. And it, it, it so something's wrong, okay. So in any case, we could separate that out. So we have models where it works and models where it, that generation approach doesn't work. So the model in, in, this, in this benchmark, there's only one where it doesn't work, and we get nothing. Um, but on the models where it does work, you get a lot of separation. And once you're past, once you're past about here, so somewhere around a quarter of a second or something like that, it's, it's 10 times faster or 100 times faster the, the in, counter exam in counter examples per second space. So it's a much, much more effective generator. Okay, so um, recap of the three generators. The ad hoc random generation, the one that just generates from the non-terminals, is surprisingly effective and simple. If you haven't tried this on software that you maintain, it will find bugs. That's my experience with random generation, random testing, is that if you haven't tried it, it will find a bug. Right? And Well, I suppose if you haven't proved your program correct. Um, enumerations have a lot of good variety in small terms. And the type-based generation is extremely effective, a lot more effective than the approaches, if it works at all, and it doesn't work at all. So another case where it doesn't work is if you are studying something that doesn't have a type system, then it also doesn't work, right? <laughs> um, so it, it's, it, it, it's more limited applicability, but when it, when it's a, when it applies, it's great. Yeah? That's right. That's correct.
That's right. That's correct. That's correct. That's right. That's right. I'm I'm positioning it more based on the space in which Redux is useful, than and that that is kind of casting its shadow over the whole talk. Although one of the things in the benchmark suite was the red black trees. Um, right. Okay. All right. So I just want to leave you with a thought that. You should run your research. Okay, you get a lot of mileage. We are spending so much time understanding and improving programming languages. Why shouldn't we like use them in our day-to-day -day life too? Right? Okay. So um, I want to mention two other people here. Jay did a lot of work um, with Max on the enumerations and has also provided lots of good help making Redux more efficient. And nothing in Racketdom would would work at all, would exist at all without Matthew. Like everything that's even remotely related to Racket, you sh there should probably be an acknowledgement to Matthew in it. And of course, that's why there never is. Today is his birthday, though. So if you see him, wish him a happy birthday. All right, thank you. <laughs>